there was a certain man from Ramathane, a Zubite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihim, the son of Tohu, the son of Zub, an Ephraim. He had two eyes.
No one really knows what started the problem. But over the years, the anger and animosity between the two families grew, and before it was over, 13 people were dead. And the feud became so notorious, it was front page news, even in other parts of the country. And the two names became synonymous for holding a grudge. When folks would talk about two people who were angry with one another and couldn't get along, they'd say, they fight just like the Hatfields and McCoys. It's a mystery of the human condition that we prefer to hold on to something painful rather than letting go and moving on. Anger is an instinctive human emotion. It's a normal reaction to mental or physical stress. It can motivate you to change your lives uh, for the better and make you a better person. But if anger becomes chronic, it becomes the focus of our daily lives, then it becomes destructive. Anger is like a drug. It can make you feel strong and powerful for a little while, but once you get strung out on it, you start feeling weak and powerless. All of, you, all of us know someone who, needs to, who seems to be stuck in some kind of rut of resentment. Every year it seems like they're fighting the same battles, they get upset about the same things, they get angry with the same people, they get in the same arguments about the same things. People who won't talk to one another, people who put on an attitude whenever that certain other person is around, and it goes on year after year after year. As a matter of fact, people will stay angry about something so long they can't even remember what they were angry about in the first place. Because the anger has taken on a life of its own. Anger is like a chain that connects us to some kind of pain or bitterness in our past. Maybe it's someone who treated you badly. And whenever you see them, all those old feelings of pain and hurt and resentment well up inside you. Or maybe it's something that happened in your lives that you just can't get over. And every time you think about it, you start to get angry all over again. Or, or maybe it's an object that represents some kind of failure that we think we had in our past. Something we can't put behind us. And every time we see it, we have that old familiar pain. When your anger binds you to someone or something, it's just like working on a chain gang. Anybody remember those old pictures of the, of the, the out of usually in the South, God help us, a uh, bunch of men out by the side of the road, chained together by their ankles, uh, cutting the grass or busting rock, working in the hot sun. I mean, this is what anger can do to you. No matter what you do, you can't get loose. You work all day, you expend a whole lot of energy. And at the end of the day, you have really nothing to show for it, and you have to get up the next day and do the same thing all over again. Every day is the same. You can't break loose. When you're on a chain gang, it's really someone else who's controlling you, isn't it? Someone else who's calling the shots. Someone else that you're working for. Think about it. When you let someone else light your fuse or pull your strings, you are giving them a measure of control over your own life. And your reaction to that provocation can chain you to that person. Just like the Hatfields and the McCoys. You're a prisoner to your own anger. That's what happened in this text. Now I know this text is a very patriarchal text. And let's spend a moment talking about patriarchy is the rule of men over women. Right? And we need to realize that whenever we read anything in the Testament, we're generally looking at a very patriarchal society, right? A, a man could marry as many wives as he wanted, God help it. But a woman could only marry one man. Right? A father could sell their children into slavery if they want to, divorce or sell his wife. A man could do anything he want. Patriarchal societies still exist, right? And they can kill. 200 young girls kidnapped in northern Nigeria by terrorists, not for ransom, but to force to go into a forced marriage and religious conversion. Honor killings in which a family would kill their own daughter for wanting to marry the wrong person. But even in the midst of a patriarchal society, this text shows us that it's still possible for God to affirm the true value and worth of someone like Hannah by hearing and answering her prayer. Now in the text that we read, you see that it's party time before the tabernacle. Remember the tabernacle, this is where the Ark of the Covenant was, 
remember? And they built a, a tabernacle so they could carry the Ark of the Covenant along with them until they settled in the land. And when they settled in the land, they figured, well, okay, we need to put this thing someplace. So they put it in a town called Shiloh. And once a year, there was a big blowout party. Everybody went to Shiloh for a week, two weeks, whatever, and had a big party there. Lots of eating and drinking, lots of fun, or at least it was supposed to be, right? The only problem was every time Elkanah went to the big party with his wives, there was a problem because at the party there was a scene where the party was going on, but every year Hannah would get so upset by what was going on. Uh, you know, in this society, the patriarchal society, it's the, it's the men who have all the power. So the deal is if you're a wife, the, the only thing you're really responsible for is having children and running the family. But when you have children, you better make sure you have male children. Right? Because the, all the power, all the land, all the money goes down on the men's side of the thing, not on the women's side. So if you were a woman and you couldn't have children, most people would think there was some kind of problem going on here. Obviously there must be a problem between the husband and wife. Maybe uh, if they believe God had shut them, oh well, he must have done something to make God keep you from having children. And so every year at the big party, Penina would come and trot out her children, her son, and then look at him, how much he's grown from last year. Boy, he's look at how fast he runs. Look at the girls, aren't they beautiful? And Hannah was just off to the side, like this. But what does the text say? It says, Elkanah loved Hannah. Right? But there was just one problem with this. Elkanah was an idiot, right? <laughs> Most men, most husbands in the Bible are idiots, right? But they haven't got a clue, right? They're wimp, the, the wives are smart, but the husbands are stupid, right? Uh, uh, Joseph, right? Mary's husband, right? Uh, the middle of the night, an angel comes to Joseph and says, Joseph, uh, your wife's going to have a child, and he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords, and he's going to rule on the throne of his, of his father David and of the, of the, of the powers of king. There will be no end. And Joseph says, oh, cool. You know, it, just, it just completely goes over the top. Uh, he really cannot understand what's, what's going on. Uh, uh, king David, right, you know, a big, powerful king, stays at home and sends his army out to fight his battle. On the roof of his palace, he looks over and sees a, a woman bathing naked, bathing on the roof of the house next to him. That's Sheba. Oh, I'm, I'm. Commands her to come to his, his throne room, couple Weeks, months later, she turns up and says, I'm pregnant. He says, well, he calls his commander and says, if you find her husband, send him to the stronghold of the enemy where I know he's going to get killed, right? And then she'll be a widow and I can marry her. And thinks no one in the whole society will know what's going on. It's like Game of Thrones. <laughs> you know? Just an idiot, right? It's El Canada. This time it's El Canada, this idiot, right? He finds the one person that won't eat and puts a double portion on her plate, right? And everybody looks over and says, ah, here we go again. Once again, year after year, the same old animosity, the same old problems. And then he pulls it up. He says, don't I mean more to you than ten sons? A question that you can't answer positively either way you answer it, right? Just don't, right? El Canada was dumb. But he loved his wife, Hannah, and he loved his wife, Penina. Now you cannot carry pain and anger around your heart without contaminating everything else in your life. If I get angry with just one person, my anger reflects on my relationship with everyone else I come in contact with. It's as though I was chained to those problems and everywhere I go, I drag that pain and that problem along with me. People don't want to be around someone who's upset all the time. When they see him coming down the street, they oh no, this uh, she's gonna she's gonna he's gonna talk about this again. He's gonna I can't handle it. Like, Go to the other side of the street. Right? Well, the, the, the Christians do too. We come to God's house. We come before God's altar. Right? Well, we kneel down. Well, oh God, I'm gonna give you all my problems, all my all my situations. I'm gonna leave them at your feet. And before we go, we pick it up and put it back in our pocket and walk off. And we leave with the same problems that we came in with. Right? That's why the old hymn says, take your burdens to the Lord and leave them there. Right? But Hannah was provoked year after year until something happened inside of her. It's the text says that one year she stood up. You know, no one else will stand up for you. Sometimes you have to stand up for yourself. 
You know, God does not make junk. And God does not want his children to be treated like junk. Right? So there comes a point where you have to say, enough is enough. Maybe she realized that all this pain she was carrying around was destroying her life and her family's life. Some of the best advice you can have in the world is don't go to bed with anger on your heart. Right? Don't go to bed with anger on your heart. Hannah wanted to get rid of this pain in her life. She wanted to stop dragging around all those problems that she couldn't get free from. And the text says that she eventually went to the house of the Lord and started to pray. Now, if you're going to pray for the Lord to break your chains, you better know who you're paying, praying to. Because what you need may determine how you call on God. Now, if you want the Lord to be your healer, then you need to pray, pray to Jehovah Rapha, right? The Lord who heals. If you need God to sustain you, you need to pray to Jehovah Jireh, right? The Lord will provide. These are all Hebrew names for God in the Old Testament, right? The name Hannah used to call on the Lord tells us what she needed at the time. She prayed, the scripture says she prayed to Jehovah Shabbat, which the, all of our good seminarians here will know will mean the Lord Almighty or the Lord of hosts, right? This is the kind of prayer you pray when you need somebody to fight your battles for you, right? She felt she was in a war that she couldn't win. She felt put upon. She felt she was up against something she couldn't handle. So she called on the Lord of hosts, the commander of the heavenly army, to intercede on her behalf. When we call on the name of the Lord of hosts, we're asking God to fight the battle that we can't fight for ourselves, right? So this Hannah and her experience here can teach us a few things about how to break her chains. First, go to the place where God is. That's what Hannah did. She says, I'm going to go to the temple of the Lord. And she went there and she wept and she prayed to the Lord. She didn't have it out with Penina. She didn't call a psychic friend. She didn't book a spot on Jerry Springer. Like, she went to the house of God. She needed a breakout experience to get off the chain gang. And the only place that was going to happen was in God's house. The next thing she did was she took it to the Lord in prayer. Right? Why? Because prayer changes things. Right? It changes the way things are. It changes how we feel, and it changes how God feels about us, right? That's why the scripture says, what? If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. You can't make a deal with God, but you can buy into the deal that God has already made with all creation. And when you pray, uh, uh, have the courtesy to be honest with God, right? Hannah told God exactly what was on her heart. You know, when you're angry, you have to be careful of what you say to people with your family. Amen? Like uh, 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 James said, what the anger of human beings doesn't work the righteousness of God. But if God is your friend, you don't have to worry about you say God. Right? You see, our relationship with God should be so close that you don't have to worry about what we say when we're angry or hurt. If someone is really my friend, I don't have to worry about what I say. I know I can tell them anything. And God should be my closest friend. When you pray and you're angry or sad, tell God how you do. Don't make an excuse for yourself and tell God everything is all right when you're in trouble. God already knows what you're going through. Right? It's all right to tell Him what's on your heart. If you're angry, tell God about it. If you're happy, if you're sad, if your heart is breaking, tell God about it. If you want to have a meaningful relationship with anybody, you have to be honest with them. Right? Our relationship with God should be so close that we don't have to worry about revealing our innermost feelings. Hannah wasn't afraid to tell God exactly how she felt. Right? And because God loves us, we know that God's going to respond to that prayer. Once you get off the chain gang, then almost anything is possible. Wonderful story about a town in Georgia, Savannah, Georgia. And like many cities on the East Coast, there was a place in the old town where the slave ships came and docked and unloaded the prisoners, the slaves from West Africa in the 18th and the 19th century. And so the city fathers and mothers got together and they said, we want to come and make this spot. We want to build a statue there. And they decided to build a statue of a black family, right? A man, a woman, boy, and a girl with the chains and the shackles of slavery lying broken at their feet. 
And then there was a meeting where they had to decide what the words were going to be at the bottom of the statue. And one person said, oh, we've got it all lined up. We've got Maya Angela is going to come in and write the words at the bottom of the statue. I'm like, oh, who, who passed, by the way, earlier? This was a wonderful poet and writer. And they brought out the words that she wanted to put on the bottom of the thing. And the words read, we were stolen, sold, and brought together from the African, African continent. We got on the slave ships together. We lay back to belly in the hold of the slave ships in each other's excrement and urine together, sometimes died together, and our lifeless bodies were thrown overboard together. And the people who had bought and paid for the monument for the looked at the word and said, no way we're going to put that on the bottom of this thing. Oh, those words are inflammatory, they're abusive, they're hurtful, and we're not going to put them at the bottom of the statue. The other side of one of them, pretty soon war broke out. Right? So the accusation started flying back and forth. Uh, memories of old injustices and hurts started to come to the surface. Old anger and animosity. So for 10 years, the project was stopped because of an argument about what to put on the bottom. Until the poet herself added one additional line to the poem that broke the impasse and allow the monument to be built. So now when you go there and look at the bottom of the statue, you find these words. We were stolen, sold, and brought together from the African continent. We got on the slave ships together. We lay back to belly in the holes of the slave ships in each other's excrement and urine together, sometimes died together, and our lifeless bodies were thrown overboard together. And the new line was, today we are standing up together with faith and even some joy. Isn't it amazing how just one little line at the begin at the end of the poem changed the whole trajectory of what came before? Maybe your story hasn't been so great up till now. Let the master poet write the next line of your story. When you decide to stand up with faith in God, you can have some joy that passes all understanding. Because God can take a sad story and give it a happy ending. That's what he did with Hannah. Earlier this week, my wife and I and our pastor went to a funeral of the son of a close friend of ours, a young man named Tony Griffin, 49 years old. And Tony had been a star football player in his younger days. Tony didn't look like much. Tony was short. Tony was skinny. Tony had bow legs, but Tony could run like the wind. And when he got to wherever he was going, he could put a hit on somebody that would just lay him out. And his records still stand at Crockett High School where he played. After that, he played at the University of Texas with our pastor, by the way, and had a short career in the pros. At the funeral, there were dozens of ex-football players and coaches who got up and told story about all of his incredible exploits on the field. But when his football career was over, Tony started hanging around with kind of a rough bunch of people. He got in trouble with the law, got in trouble with his family, particularly his father, who felt that he had brought shame on the family for having such a wonderful career. And as the years went by, it was clear that there was something wrong with Tony. His personality changed. Eventually, he lost the ability to speak. He still understood, but the only way that he could respond was by giving the thumbs up sign. Eventually he could no longer feed or clothe himself or bathe himself, and his family had to put him in an adult care facility, and they couldn't find one that, that could treat him the way they finally had to move him back home and took care of him uh, there for years, giving him literally 24 hour a day care. And at the funeral, Tony's father got up to speak, which is rare at a, at a funeral. And he told the people that for years he had been angry at his son. And that he'd become so much so that he was estranged from him, hadn't spoken to him in years. Angry at his choices, angry for what he put his family through. And he told them that his son suffered from CTE. This is a chronic traumatic encephalopathy. This is a degenerative condition of the brain that comes from having too many concussions. From all of his 
football career. And all during the time that Tony was at home and his family was caring for him, his family was still angry, angry that the, about the burden that his son's life had become, angry at the sacrifices the family had to make, angry at the disease that was taking him away, and angry at the disease that seemed like it would never end. And then one day, his father said he realized why his son was holding on. He wasn't waiting for some appointed time. He wasn't trying to punish the family anymore. His father said, he was waiting for me. He was waiting for reconciliation. He was waiting for restoration. He was waiting for the last line of his story to be changed. And his father went to him, told him he wanted to make things right between them, confessed his anger and asked his forgiveness and his son looked at him and went. Two weeks later, his son passed away. Oh. Now, the old folks will tell you, tomorrow is not given. So, while we have time, if you're tired of living with anger, tired of working on the chain gang, stand up, take it to the Lord in prayer. Unburden your heart. The scripture says that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you unleash on earth will be unleashed in heaven. So if you want to release the peace, get rid of the chain. Let loose of your anger, your fear, and your heartache. Give it to the Lord. Break out of the chain gang. Hannah could tell you something about the grace of God. Remember I told you uh, the Hebrew names meant something? Hanina's name means jewel. Right? Like a jewel, right? She was pretty. Right? Her name was Jewel. Of course, she stung like a scorpion, but her name was still Jewel. Right? <laughs> Hannah's name means grace. Oh. Right? And I think she could tell you something about grace. Maybe when she was work, worshiping, she could say, maybe, amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Or maybe she'd say, I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. Out of barrenness comes new birth. Out of hopelessness comes the promise of life from the one who has the power to set the captives free. Just like him, we come before this altar, broken, battered, bruised, but we still have an opportunity to write a new line to our story. What are we waiting for?